Hi there, I'm Leisure B and you're watching part 2 of Human Workshop's Building the Tonecraft Studio. In this video we're going to take a closer look at the original room we had in mind and how all attempts we made to make the room sound better failed miserably. Here you can see the original room all cleaned up with one of the obsolete base walls we've created. The room is about 8 square meters and 2.6 meters in height, which is by default too small to create a serious studio space. In order to make use of midfield speakers, one needs a room of at least 16 square meters to make sure one has certain areas where the sound is more or less neutral. Since we were not convinced of this minor detail, we decided to give the acoustic treatment a go. The first thing we did was clear out all the acoustic foam and insulation material with which Anne had attempted to acoustically optimize the room. Now, let's first take a look at the acoustic foam. This stuff is often used for optimizing a studio space, but it's actually not helping matters. What acoustic foam does, especially when the whole room is covered with it, is completely take away all reflections or reverb of any sound played in the room. However, this mainly goes for softer sources with little to no bass range. If the walls behind the foam are made out of concrete or bricks, and you're playing music from your monitor speakers, most of the low range sound will still be reflected. In other words, the acoustic foam has no direct influence on the reflections of the low spectrum and can therefore be considered more of a pain in the ass than any kind of solution to your studio. Don't get me wrong though, it's great for building vocal booths and should surely not completely be disregarded in the process when building a studio. Also, he had 10 cm thick styropore plates underneath the foam which, due to its amazing ability to resonate along with the low tones, was not helping much either. The one thing one should learn here, which we didn't, is that you shouldn't just go out and buy random shit for acoustic treatment because it just doesn't work that way. To a certain degree it is of course a hit and miss process, but there are certain rules which you should definitely observe. The bass reflections were really fucking up the sound from the Alasis M1 MK2 Ultra speakers. This was mainly made clear by how some positions in the room seemed to have no bass at all, while others were drenched in it. In small rooms, the bass frequencies tend to sum up or diminish due to the small range the reflection has, as you can see and hear in this animation. Again, not knowledgeable of the basic principles of acoustics, I suggested we build a completely new hanging wall of rock wool in the back of the room, so no bass reflections would come back from the back of the room. Now before you mark Andy crazy for attempting this stupid idea, please keep in mind I have a degree in sound design and therefore seem to have some authority in the field. So Andy drove to the shop, bought some wood and rock wool and we proceeded to build the wall. Sure as hell the wall didn't make any difference whatsoever and Andy decided it was time to approach matters in a more professional manner. He dug up an article on recording.de where these guys were building a studio in Kreuzberg, Berlin. The studio was built in a highly reflective space which should be considered a nightmare for any studio builder. This meant that they really had to pull every trick in the book to make the room work, which seemed like a good starting point for us to work from. For a link to the article please check out the video description. The first thing Andy did was download REW. REW is a free acoustic measurement program and just to make things clear here, it's amazing. Just don't expect it to immediately tell you how to fix your room. When used correctly, and you most certainly should make sure that you do, REW gives you a clear graphical representation of what you hear in your room. Even more than in other professions, in audio land there is always an enormous danger of oversaturating your input. Of course, your ears are usually the most reliable source of input when working on an audio related project, but after a day or two of working on an acoustic setup, it is almost impossible to determine the exact difference of before and after the treatment. REW gives you an exact visual representation of, among other features, the reflections and decay times of the frequencies in your room. This means that it clearly visualizes what you hear and pretty much takes the oversaturation of the ears out of the equation. REW requires the purchase of one Behringer ECM 8000 mic and a decibel meter, which I would strongly advise. We started off by using the decibel meter Android app, which wasn't closely as effective as using a 40 euro decibel meter from the local hardware store. For more information and download of REW, please visit the video description link. After making measurements with REW, Andy decided it would be best to start off by putting some bass traps in the corners. 
Since base tends to accumulate in corners, it is always a good idea to take care of this as much as possible by putting base absorbers in there. In our case, we built the corners in triangles of 50 times 50 centimeters. After taking measurements, we noticed that the room conditions had most certainly approved, but were still way out of range of the desired results. Since the base range had most surely improved, we decided to keep the spirits high and build an acoustic diffuser to take care of a nasty problem we had in the mid-range spectrum, around 700 Hz. You don't want to take away all reflections from the room since this would make it sound unnatural and would make it very tiresome to work in your studio. You want to spread the mid and the high range spectrum of the sound in such a way that it kind of scatters back at you. This is why God created the diffuser. To design a diffuser yourself, you either need to be highly skilled in mathematics or, when you're not, make use of another nifty little free program which shows you how to build one depending on the size of your room, the problematic frequency and the distance of the listening position. This program is called QR Dude. More info about it as well as a download link are available from the description of this video. So, we designed and built the diffuser by the given parameters and lord behold, the problem seemed to get less. Noticeable. The final and very important move we made was the exact positioning of the speakers. Once again, this is where REW is critical for creating the ideal hotspot. The hotspot is the listening position where the sound of the speakers comes to you most natural. In the ideal circumstances, the hotspot is not just a spot, but more like an area of about 60 cm in diameter in a relatively small studio space. The smaller the space, the smaller the hotspot. By positioning your speakers in different places according to a previously determined logical pattern, you can determine what works best in your room. Since the speakers and the hotspot always need to form an equilateral triangle, the main things you can work on are the distance of the speakers relatively to each other and the position of the speakers from the wall. Let me tell you, you'll be amazed by the difference the variation of both parameters makes. So, we measured the room and the results had clearly improved. However, after thorough testing and use of the room, it turned out to be still a major pain in the ass when working in it. The bass range still proved to be relatively to very unstable, depending to the position of your head, within a range of about 30 centimeters. Also, we had a major dip in the 700 Hz range, which made it almost impossible to properly mix lead instruments. After all this trouble, Andy still seemed determined to create a studio space in which you can work properly, because he mentioned that it still sucks balls. The room was just too small and the walls, the ceiling and the roof were built out of the wrong materials. There was just no way to seriously improve this room, so the only choice we had left was to build a completely new room in the barn, which he happened to also own. Now I realize that for most people that might be a pretty bumming conclusion, but hey, that's just the way it seems to work in acoustics. Usually there are no easy solutions. However, by skipping all our missteps and using the tips and tricks you will find in part 3 to 5 of this series, you might still be able to build a professional audio workspace with as little cash and effort as possible. Which is still not little of both, by the way. Right, that's it. I'm off. We'll leave you with a couple of cool pictures we took during the building of the actual studio. Have fun, enjoy, and I'll see you soon.